Hi guys. Okay, so let's look at the Lewis dot structures of those uh, molecules in which the atoms follow the octet rule and they defy the octet rule. For example, sulfur. Sulfur can make two bonds. As we know, it is in group 6A. It has six electrons in its outermost shell, that is the valence electrons, and it just needs two more to satisfy the octet. So in what conditions does it follow the octet? And the sulfur defies the octet as well. In other words, the sulfur can make more than two bonds. It can make four bonds and it can make six bonds. And how does this happen? Let's find out in this video. Just wait with me. Okay, so as you can see on the screen, we are going to cover three examples, H2S, sulfur dioxide, and the sulfate ion, their Lewis structures. So first of all, let's just go over the Lewis dot structures, the rules and the steps that uh, you know we use to follow. So first of all, always count the total number of valence electrons. Next, identify the central atom. Central atom is identified based on the capacity to make the maximum number of bond. So that atom gets to be in the center. Next is the atom with a lower electronegativity gets to be in the center, but not always. So hold on to that. Next is place the atom, which you identified to be the central atom in the middle, and then the other atoms are placed around it. So always go with that step. Next is you connect all the outer atoms with a single bond to the central atom. And each single bond uses two electrons. Okay, so count the total number of single bonds you use times two or two electrons are used to make the single bonds, count that many, and subtract this number from the total number of valence electrons. The leftover electrons are first placed on the outer atom to fill their octet if they follow the octet. But if they do not follow the octet, you move on, which means hydrogen, you do not place the remaining electrons to fill the octet on hydrogen. This is a very common mistake. I see the students making that. So this is an exception to the rule here. So keep the note of it. Okay. So this one right here. Hydrogen, do not follow the octet. Next is any leftover electrons after you have finished filling the octet of the outer atoms, then you go to the central atom and any leftover electrons are placed on the central atom. Now you're going to check. What are you going to check? Number one, whether the octet of each atom is met. If it's yes, then it's good. If no, then you have to do some more work. Next thing you're also going to check, and this is important, which a lot of people just ignore. And this is, you need to see whether the need to make the bond of every single atom has been satisfied or not. If the need has been satisfied and the octet is met and sometimes the octet is not followed by the atom, which is okay. But the need to make the bond is always taking the that priority, okay? So take that. Now next is if the need is not met or if the need is met or if the octet is not met or if the octet is met, whatever, you have to check all those things, you're going to do a rearrangement in order to accomplish this step eight. So what kind of rearrangement? Lone pairs on the outer atoms are used to make the double bonds. If the atom wants to make a double bond, in other words, the atom has a capacity to make the double bond, then use the lone pairs. Next is if there are, again, the central atom has a certain capacity to make the bond. So don't go over just because other atoms want to make double bonds. Then it, it, it's not that. You have to see the central atom, the maximum capability of the central atom. And if that does that capability, if there is a limitation, then the only thing that is possible is the resonance, which is the delocalization of double bonds and the charges. So we are going to look at that. Next is you want to, this is for a higher level course, for you know, higher courses, higher courses, they use the formal charges also, the concept of formal charge. But you know, there's no reason why a lower level introductory course cannot use the concept of formal, formal charge. It's very easy. In fact, the formal charges um, is used to verify whether you got the right structure or not, okay? So when you use the formal charge to check that, um, that, that kind of double verifies your, um, your Lewis dot structure. 
Like, because see, we don't see the atoms. We cannot see the atoms. We cannot see the molecules. We cannot see the bonds in between the molecules. And here we are talking about the Lewis dot structures, right? And we always say, oh, this is correct. This is not correct. So in order to, you know, uh, like um, uh, our, our confirm, you know, further. So we use all these different uh, methods to further confirm our understanding of the, you know, bonding in the molecule. So anyways, so here are, please note, this is very important. And you're not going to find this commonly here and there, you know, so I've made this information provided to you here, that atoms that defy the octet. And which ones are those? We have, uh, let me put this here, we have phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and xenon. When they connect with the less electronegative atoms or when they connect to themselves. So in that case, they will only make their usual number of bonds to satisfy the octet. So here these atoms will follow the octet. So here I'm going to write down here, 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 they, are following the octet rule in this in, in this bonded state when with, they connect with the um, low, lower uh, electronegative atoms okay so for example hydrogen and they connect with like phosphorus and hydrogen can make ph3 let's put this here um, this is one second. So with P, like phosphorus and hydrogen, pH3, phosphorin will make three bonds. Sulfur and hydrogen, sulfur is making two bonds, like in H2S. Oxygen, obviously, will make, you know, two bonds. So you don't need oxygen, just take this molecule here. So we will have, um, the, uh, like, chlorine, fluorine, bromine, iodine, all these, when they combine with hydrogen, which is less electronegative, they make their usual number of bonds, which depends on their number of valence electrons, number of valence electrons. And then based on that, you know, they want to have eight electrons in the last shell, right? So number of electrons plus that many more electrons are added or are, are shared, rather. So to make to, to, to make those bonds, okay? Next is the conditions in which these atoms do not follow the octet rule and they make the multiple number of bonds. So for example, you have here phosphorus. Phosphorus, again, phosphorus, when it combines with a more electronegative atom and that more electronegative atom is usually oxygen or among themselves also. So let's just put this here, that among themselves or among themselves. For example, chlorine and bromine can combine, right? Xenon can combine with oxygen, sulfur and chlorine can combine those things. So when they are combined with a more electronegative atom, in that case, they can make, um, they can make, five bonds in the case of phosphorus, four and six bonds in the case of sulfur, three, five, and seven bonds these chlorine, bromine, and iodine make, and xenon, we know, does not make any bonds, right? But here, xenon is capable of making two, four, and six bonds. So in that case, xenon um, will expand its capabilities to, you know, to come up. So we see these examples. We see hyper hyperchlorate, chlorate, you know, chloride, and then sulfite, sulfate, sulfur trioxide, sulfur dioxide, phosphite, phosphate, phosphorus pentachloride, all those in these conditions, you if you if you look at the electronegativity of chlorine and oxygen, chlorine has less electronegative than oxygen, sulfur is less electronegative than oxygen, phosphorus is less electronegative than oxygen, phosphorus is less electronegative than chlorine. So in that case, phosphorus has expanded its capability, you know, to make five bonds instead of the usual three bonds. Yes, I mean, phosphorus can combine and make three bonds with chlorine also, but it can also make five bonds and so forth. Okay, so now let's look at these are variable valence state. Valence is the valence. What is the meaning of valence? Generally, valence 
um, valence, you, you see valence electrons, but valence states mean the cap capacity to make bonds. Capacity, capacity to make bonds. Now here's something, keep this in mind. We already know about metals. You already know, for example, I'm going to take one example here of copper. Okay, copper and copper exists in plus one state. Copper exists in plus two state. Okay, so in what condition is this happening? So we know that, let's look at this. Um, copper has 29 electrons. Okay, so let's do the electronic configuration of copper, which is um, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4, sorry, 4s2, and 3d9. Okay, so now what is happening here? In this case, let's look at the um, the inner core is that of argon. So, um, oh, sorry, this is, why did I read? This is 3P, um, 3P6. Okay. All right. So we have this inner core of argon, argon inner core, and you can put like these 18 electrons here so that we can just focus on the outermost um, uh, electrons. So we have uh, 4s2 and 3d9. Okay, now let's look at the, this is the valence shell. This is the largest shell number, largest shell number. And so therefore, this is the valence shell. And how many electrons are there? Valence shell is 4s2, and there are four. Uh, there are two valence electrons. Okay, so now let's look at the um, orbital diagram. So here is the 3d9. So one, two, three, four, five. So that's the 3d, and this is the 4s. So here are these electrons. Um, one, two, that's the 4s, and 3d9 is one, to always fill the orbital singly in the orbital diagrams. So we filled in five and then the remaining four are paired. So like this, you fill them. So you have one unpaired electron and this one unpaired electron is in the 3D um, orbital. So one unpaired electron is like, kind of causing problems. What does that mean? It means there is a Hund's rule which says that fulfilled, always remember that, fulfilled and half-filled orbitals are more stable. So half-filled orbitals are more stable. So what happens in this case when we talk about stability means non-reactive, means lower energy state. So stable means lower energy state or non-reactive. Okay. All right. So now what is going to happen? This is in a neutral neutral copper atom. Okay, neutral copper atom, this is the scenario. So in what happens when copper makes plus two and plus one? So let's look at this. Um, copper, when it's losing one electron, so it gets plus one charge, okay? So in what condition is that? So here is this copper's inner core, argon. Sorry, let's just do it, the blue color argon, inner core, 18 electrons, outer core 4s2, and you have 3d9. So where is that one electron going? It's not this one. This one is an unpaired electron, that's fine, but it is not this one that leaves. For the most part, because we want the half filled is more stable, full filled, and so the internally, you know, they, there is an internal jumping happens. So in that case, what happens? So we have here 
um, give me one minute. So we have 4S2 and 3D9, one, two, three, four, five. And let's pull this. So 4S2 and 3D9, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. And now what happens? There is an internal jumping. So internal jumping means that this electron jumps and comes, one of the electron jumps and comes here. And so that this one gets paired, okay? So minus one electron from there, and it comes on the on the D side. And so now this is this rearrangement happens. So one, one, two, three, four, five. And now we have one electron here. This is still the last shell. The 4S is still the last shell. This is the 3D. This is the 3D. This is 4S. Okay, and now we have all these electrons in 3D paired. And this is an ideal condition. This is fulfilled. This is fulfilled orbital. Um, sorry. This is a fulfilled orbital state. So 3D three, three has 10. Here it was 3D9. Let's put this here. This was 3D9. And the other guy was... 4s2, 4s2, but now we have 4s1, 4s1, and this is 3d10. So this is fulfilled, more stable, full, filled, and more stable. Okay, so when this is more stable orbital, that means this is better, better condition. Now copper loses that one electron. So where is that one electron going to go from? From the outermost shell. And that that is that outermost shell is, outermost is still 4S. The valence shell is still that. So the outermost shell and outermost orbital is 4S1, containing one electron, right? So Yes, so now we have the orbital, the copper, copper plus one looking like this. Argon, 18, 4s, 0, 3d, 10. Okay, so this is one scenario where, you know, where there's this internal jumping happens. Let me put this in a different um, thing. This is internal jumping of electrons from a lower energy state or a, from a higher energy state to a lower energy state or lower energy to higher, all that happens. And that happens again at a specific temperature and pressure, it's pressure, temperature and pressure or some kind of, you know, conditions, simple, you know, even if it's like when you give some kind of energy exchange and it could simply be friction also when you mix things, so whenever there is an ex energy exchange or you give some more some energy to this atom then it this thing happens now let's look at another scenario in which copper is in plus 2 state and that is this one which one is that copper plus 2 state so in this condition we will have same thing let's do this um argon Sorry, for it. So here we have um, argon inner core. Okay, eighteen electrons and four s zero three d nine. So in other words, it again depends on the reaction conditions. So when the electrons are, you know, um, in 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 the four s, they they you give it energy. It depends on the reaction conditions for five, these electrons uh, don't have much time to do internal jumping. So 3D will still retain its nine electrons. And, and although it prefers the 10, but internally, you know, this one is still on the three, the three D nine is still like one of them is still um, unoccupied, uh, like uh, unpaired. But four S and the two electrons go from here. So, so these are actually the valence electrons, 
valence. Two valence electrons are lost. And again, it depends on the conditions. So that is why you see this happens in the metals. This, this scenario happens in the metals that we see copper and copper plus one, copper two, same thing with iron plus one, iron plus two, same story, uh, iron plus, sorry, iron, I'm sorry, iron plus two and iron plus three. Okay, so iron can lose three electrons and iron can lose six electrons based on this rule, this, this phenomena of internal jumping of electrons, of electrons. You know, so this is the this is one this is the reason why this happens. Okay, now let's move further. What is happening with sulfur? And same thing with phosphorus, and the same thing with uh, with uh, with um, um, uh, chlorine, fluorine, bromine, iodine. What's happening here? So let's look at the uh, example where we have um, number. This is number two and. Sorry, I just want to make sure I have the colors the same. Okay, so two, and we're going to look at the non-metals. Non-metals such as phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and xenon. These guys, especially these, will have 3D also available to them. Although it is not used, but 3D is available. And this is available for internal jumping. So 3D available means, and it is not in used in the neutral molecule. So not, and here also the D is available. Um, we have to see which one, which, which of the Ds is that, but D is available for this also. So available in neutral atoms. And so the D orbital is sitting vacant. D orbital is vacant. So then what happens when it's just sitting vacant? What happens then? So let's look at the story with sulfur and we will go from there. Okay, so here is sulfur with um, sulfur. Okay, sulfur is 16 electrons, okay? So 16 electrons, let's do the electronic configuration. One is two, two is, so always do the electronic configuration so you can see the electrons. So even though it's not required, but I like to do it so that I, you can see the internal picture, what's happening. So one is two, two is two, two P six, three S two and three P four. Okay, so we see here that this piece right here, these are the six valence electrons. The valence shell is, valence shell, is always the highest shell number, highest shell number. Okay, valence shell is the highest shell number. So the valence shell is the third shell, the third energy you know, level. So remember that three, third, third, third energy level or third shell contains S, P and D. It is there. It doesn't matter if it's not being used because you know you can only place that many electrons in the shell. So now we have, look at the orbital diagram of sulfur. Orbital, orbital diagram of sulfur and of sulfur in different conditions. So here we have, um, the sulfur. Now here we have, um, sorry, uh, sulfur 16. And let's just put the inner core. This is the inner core, which is of 10 electrons that like of neon. Okay. So, so we have inner core neon 10, and you have the outer core 3s2 and 3p. Four. 
Okay, now we have, in this case, the orbital, the, the orbital diagram looks like, sorry, 3s2 and 3p4, one, two, three. So remember, p can only have three orbitals. So this is 3s and this is 3p, okay? 3s2 looks like what? 3s2 is this. 3p4 looks like what? One, two, three, and four, okay? So two unpaired electrons we see. This is the reason why sulfur will make two bonds. So two unpaired electrons when paired make bonds, okay? So now when paired with other atoms, obviously not with each other. So let's just make this clear. When paired with other, when paired with, with electrons of the other atoms, with, ele with electrons of other atoms, then the bonding occurs. That, that phenomena is called bonding. So if somebody asks you what is bonding, pairing of electrons is bonding, okay? And that's single bonding. Okay, now we are going to look at what happens in this case when, when sulfur bonds with hydrogen. Now look at the electronegativity of hydrogen. The electronegativity of hydrogen is less electronegative. Hydrogen is less electronegative than sulfur. Or in other words, the sulfur is bonding with a less electronegative atom. And how do you know that? There are two ways to see it. Okay, so I want to focus on the, first of all, how would you know that uh, hydrogen is less electronegative than sulfur? One thing is the rule. You look at the trends in the periodic table. And in those trends, you will see that um, in the same column, when you go top down in the same column from top to bottom, just move your finger and you will see that the electronegativity the value of the electronegativity goes down. So the electronegativity decreases when you go from top to bottom in the periodic table in the same column. But another thing is that in the, in the, in the row, when you go from left to right, when you go from left to right in the, in the same uh, row, the electronegativity increases. So hydrogen is in group 1A, and hydrogen has the electronegative value of 2.1. This is the second thing. This is on your handout, you have this table and you can also see this in the books if, uh, for other people who are looking at it. So <coughs> you can see the value of the electronegativity. Hydrogen is 2.1, <coughs> excuse me, and sulfur is 2.5. So obviously sulfur has more electronegative than hydrogen. So in this case, sulfur will be making two bonds. Sulfur makes two bonds. Okay. Now, how does the, how are these two bonds formed? So here is the hydrogen. Here is the hydrogen. Hydrogen, I'm going to just bring it here. Hydrogen. And this is another hydrogen. Hydrogen has what? Hydrogen has 1s1, right? Hydrogen has, let's put this in another color. Um, this is 1 and so 1s1 of hydrogen, this is the another one, 1s1. So one electron. So in other words, the atomic number, the hydrogen is one. So the electronic configuration is 1s1. The atomic number of hydrogen is one. So hydrogen has this particular electron right here. And this is another electron like here. Okay. So when these two guys overlap, remember, um, or rather, sorry, let's just do it this way when these two guys overlap, 
or you know talk to each other or overlap or bond or share electrons these two are sharing so that is leading to so this is one single bond this is one single bond and the other one is also another single bond okay so let's put here this is another single bond so that's one single bond and that is another one so one single bond so remember every single bond every single bond is made by the sharing of two electrons so you see hydrogen and sulfur they each share two electrons um, so how does this look like this is going to look like so here is your sulfur in the middle and here is this hydrogen this is another hydrogen and we are going to connect them. But how do we decide whether sulfur, this is a three atom. So this is another thing I forgot. So back to these rules of the lowest structures, you are going to see that we count the number of valence electrons. So I'm going to just follow this whole thing. So this was just to show you that, you know, sulfur will make two bonds in this scenario. Next is let's draw the Lewis structure. So we see that um, sulfur is making no, the total number of, so let's draw the Lewis structures. Lewis dot structure, okay? And this is, okay, so here we have total valence electrons, total valence electrons. For sulfur, there are six valence electrons. And this is a molecule, H2S, for example, in the case of H2S. So we would need two hydrogens, sorry to mention this here. So two hydrogens will be needed, you know, to, to bond with those, those. So two hydrogens are bonded. So we are looking at an example in which of H2S. Sorry about that. Okay, so let's look at the total valence electrons are um, for sulfur is bringing one and there are two hydrogens and each of them is bringing one electron, okay? So this total becomes eight valence electrons. So that's one piece. Next is which one is going to be in the middle, sulfur or hydrogen as a central atom? So that's something you need to identify. So we see that sulfur has lower, sorry, higher electronegativity than hydrogen. But we are going to focus not on this here, according to the rules here, um, according to the rules, the atom that has a lower electronegativity gets the central spot, but there are exceptions to this rule. So you have to keep this in mind that, you know, um, the capacity to make the bonds gets the priority, the maximum number of bonds gets the priority, okay? So the priority is the, the guy, even though it may be electronegative, but if it's capable of making more bonds, then it will be in the center. So here we have um, hydrogen <coughs> can make only one bond and sulfur can make two four and six bonds. So which one goes in the middle? Sulfur is the central atom. Okay, sulfur is the central atom. Next is you're going to look at the next piece, which is sulfur gets in the middle and you're going to put the hydrogen on the side. And the next thing is you're going to connect them with the single bonds. Each single bond each single bond uses two electrons. Therefore, four electrons have been used, okay? Then what happens? Total valence electrons are what? Total, total eight valence electrons minus four electrons from the single bond, these ones, okay? So you are left with four electrons left. 
So the rule says that fill the remaining electrons on the outer atoms to fill the octet, but we are not going to do that because hydrogen does not follow the octet rule. So keep this in mind that hydrogen, hydrogen does not follow the octet rule. So when hydrogen doesn't follow the octet rule, then what will you do? So the remaining four electrons go on sulfur. Okay, so that's, you know, because sulfur fall, can follow and sulfur can defy. So it's flexible. So the remaining four electrons are here like that. And it's going to be at an angle. So keep that angle in mind. So I have to put this here. Please keep angles at which these atoms and the uh, atoms, the bonded atoms and the non-bonded atoms, please keep angles Record, please. in mind for bonded Okay, bonded and non-bonded atoms. Non-bonded atoms. And what are non-bonded atoms? These non-bonded atoms are, bonded atoms are Ba and non-bonded atoms are NBA. So what are these non-bonded atoms? These are also the lone pairs, commonly called lone pairs of electrons. Okay, so now check. First of all, total number of electrons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All eight electrons that were, have been used, okay? Next thing is hydrogen will only make two bonds. So keep that in mind. I have to put this here somewhere. I should put this. Hydrogen will make two bonds. Um, so let's put here, hydrogen will, uh, sorry, Oh, what am I saying? I'm sorry. Hydrogen will only make one bond. Hydrogen will make one bond only and nothing, nothing more. Okay, so keep this in mind. All right, so my mistake on... Okay, and so when we talk about keeping the angles in mind for the bonded and the non-bonded atoms, that means we are talking about the valence, shell, electron, pair, repulsion theory, okay? Which means that the, the bonded electrons or uh, the non-bonded electrons or the lone pairs, right? The lone pairs, they like to occupy a separate space, you know, generally away from the bonded atoms. So lone pairs push the push the bonded atoms very far away, as far away as is possible. Okay, bonded atoms far away. You know, um, um, far far away, you know, uh, as possible. You know, it's just uh, not that they, they push them so the bonds are broken, you know. But the bonds still remain intact. You know, bonds don't break, get broken. Bonds do not break, but the, you know, in 3D, but in 3D, in, in 3D, you know, the it's all about the spatial arrangement. So spatial arrangement. Okay, now what is happening? Um, so we got that. And so now we are going to see that the hydrogens are making hydrogen. And look at the bond, just checking. So here is the fourth piece is check is, sorry, check for the need to make the bonds. Is it satisfied? So, okay. So check if hydrogen wants to make one bond or, or not. So hydrogen is making one bond 
And in that case, hydrogen is happy. Hydrogen is happy, okay? Because it only wants to make one bond. And with that said, hydrogen internally is looking like helium. Remember, that's the whole purpose of doing this bond formation is that they want to have the nearest noble gas. So nearest noble gas configuration, okay? So that's why the hydrogen is, hydrogen is, um, is happy to bond with sulfur. Now let's look at sulfur. What is the deal with sulfur? Sulfur is making two bonds and that's the, the capability of sulfur. And second thing is the sulfur is octet is also met. Sulfur has eight electrons in its outermost shell. How? Let's look at this. So as we talked about, this is the one, two, three, four. These four electrons are being shared by sulfur, the ones I pointed in green, and then four, and then five, and six, and seven, and eight. So sulfur has eight electrons. Each of these hydrogens has two electrons. This hydrogen has two electrons. And so that's making it look like, you know, a helium. So it has the configuration of helium internally. Sulfur with its eight electrons um, is uh, going to look like argon, okay? Oh, uh, so this is the deal with when sulfur makes two bonds, that's when it's connected with, um, with, uh, with hydrogen. Now that's a very happy state. So sulfur is make, so let's write this down here. So sulfur is, so octet, so looks like the nearest noble gas and octet is met. And the, so you understand that. Okay, now let's move forward with another example of sulfur dioxide in which there are two atoms of oxygen bonded to one atom of sulfur. Okay, so what is the story here? So let's look at, first of all, the electronic configuration, because it's just picture becomes much clear when you do the electronic configuration. So here is the electronic configuration of sulfur and oxygen. So we see that sulfur is 16 electrons and oxygen is eight electrons. So 16 electrons, neon, 10, okay? And then you have here, um, sulfur is uh, well, 16, one is two, two is two, two P six, three S two and three P four, okay? Now comes oxygen, 1s2, 2s2, and 2p, um, 2p4, uh, 2p4, yeah. So now, orbital diagram of sulfur, let's see. Orbital diagram of sulfur, one, two, three, and the 3d is available, one, two, three, Four, one, two, three, four, five. So this is the 3D and this is the two, uh, two, uh, two, 3P, 3P and this is 3S. Okay, now let's put these electrons here and see what picture. One, two, 3S2, 3P4, uh, one, two, three and four. Okay, now comes oxygen. Oxygen, and there are two oxygens coming in. So oxygen is um, 2s2 and 2p4. So let's do for the oxygen also. This one, the lob, this is the valence shell, which looks like this. This is the valence shell. So we will do it for oxygen is one. Sorry, let's just do this here. A uh, little bit. One, one two, okay, one, two, three, and another oxygen comes, one, two, three, and we are just doing the, uh, the, the 2s2 and 2p4. Okay, so here is the 2s and 2p, and this is 2s and 2p. This is for oxygen, 
this is for oxygen and this is the upper one is for sulfur. Okay, so we are going to put now, um, let's do this, one, one, two, three, and four. Here, oh, sorry, this is one, two. One, two, one, two, three, and four. Okay, now we have two atoms of oxygens. Okay, and this is the valence shell. This is the valence shell or the valence orbitals. Uh, let's do this here. Um, valence orbitals of oxygen. That's how it's showing. Okay, so what happens here is that we see, yes, sulfur has two unpaired electrons. Okay, but the sulfur oxygen is coming, right? So what is going to happen is an excess, excess of oxygen. So the electrons are going to jump. So this electron jumps and comes here. And when that happens, now we have another, um, So these two unpaired electrons are in the ground state. This is called the ground state. Ground state means the like when it's a normal neutral state, okay? So this is the neutral state. The, the electrons are just arranged like this, but once they, they jump, once they jump, what happens then? Then we see that the, one, two, three, and then 3D comes into play. One, two, three, four, five. So 3S will have two electrons, but 3P will have um, three electrons because one of the electrons jumped from 3P. One, two, three, and here. So in the ground state, you don't see that, obviously. But once that excited, once that, that happens, the internal jumping, and I, I just want to use, so this electron can jump. That's why I'm showing it. But in the excited state, it happens. So this is the excited, E-X-C-I-T-E-D. In the excited state, we see the um, D orbitals also comes into play. And so now there are four, unpaired electrons. And so when there are four unpaired electrons, three from 3P and one in 3D, and the there are two oxygen, then there are four unpaired electrons and two oxygens, like two in each, what's going to happen? We will see that, that this is, uh, let's get this one. These two will overlap. And this and this is overlapping. Okay, so this is one bond. This, like single bonds, and these are this one and this one is overlapping. Okay, so we see that four bonds are formed. Four bonds are formed. Okay, by the overlap of oxygens, 2P and the 3P and 3D of sulfur. So this is the condition where sulfur is capable of making four bonds. When the one electron jumps, when one electron jumps from 2P, sorry, 3P to 3D, okay? Therefore, four unpaired electrons are uh, looking for pairing. And once this pairing happens, that pairing is basically sharing of electrons, sharing of electrons from other atoms from other atoms. And this thing only happens 
sharing of electrons with other atoms, sorry, <laughs> with other atoms. And this thing only happens when there are, um, when there's, you know, oxygen is present. So in this case, okay, now let's look at the, uh, how to draw the Lewis structure. So here we see the Lewis structure. So you see why this happens, why sulfur will make four bonds? Because of that internal jumping. So, uh, let me put that word also, two pair. So, uh, excited state is in internal jumping of electrons causes that, okay? Okay, but in ground state, it doesn't happen in the excited state. So this is in the excited state in excited, <laughs> how do I put this here? All right, now let's look at the orbital diagram quickly. So we are looking at sulfur. Sulfur is one and there are two oxygens. Sulfur is bringing six electrons and there's only one sulfur atom. There are two uh, uh, oxygens and they are, each of them are bringing two, elect, uh, two, two electrons. So we will have six plus um, two, six, eight. So, sorry, this is the, six electrons coming from sulfur and 12 electrons coming from, from oxygens. So we will have a total of 18 electrons total. Okay, that's one piece. Next is we are going to put sulfur. This is one step always. Second step is sulfur has a lower electronegativity than oxygen. Oxygen has a higher electronegativity. So sulfur, the electronegativity of sulfur is 2.5. Oxygen is 3.5. So obviously, sulfur will be in the middle. Besides that, oxygen makes only two bonds. And sulfur makes two, four, and six bonds. So the maximum capability, the larger sulfur has a larger, larger capacity to make the bond because of the presence of d orbitals okay, to make bonds. So this is to make the bonds, the larger capacity is that. All right, now we are looking at the scenario where you're going to place sulfur in the middle and you're going to take the oxygens on the side, okay? And you connect them with the single bond. So you, this is these two are connected. So you have used one, two, three, four, four electrons, and you had a total of 18 electrons. So 18 electrons minus four electrons, and you're going to get 14 electrons. Remaining 14 electrons are used to fill the octet of the outer atoms, fill the octet first. So here's this oxygen, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this oxygen gets eight. So we have 14 electrons to fill. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So, and then the remaining 12, 13, 14 goes in the middle. All right. Now we are going to check, check for the need to make the bond. So sulfur is kind of okay. It's making two bonds. Sulfur can make two bonds and sulfur is fine. But oxygen wants to make two bonds. Oxygen will always, you know, prefers to make two bonds. And sulfur can make two, four, and six bonds. So sulfur is flexible, right? It can, it's, it can make four bonds and it can make six bonds. So if it can make four bonds, why will it not make four bonds? And we have already seen like this, internal jumping, right? And let's just put this here with this color, white color, this. This is what it is. Okay, and this is what is happening. So you guys can see. Okay, so now we have this sulfur can make four bonds. So, so oxygen can make two bonds if 
it gives away its lone pairs in the bond formation. So this type of rearrangement, rearrangement happens. And in this rearrangement, we see that now sulfur has um, in the middle and oxygens on the side. And we have oxygen and sulfur in double bond, oxygen and sulfur in double bond. It's two bonds it's making and that's fine. And then the, again, there's going to be a rearrangement of these outer lone pairs also. Remember, their whole idea is to spread out as far as possible. This sulfur will continue to retain its lone pairs on the top, okay? So that is the structure of sulfur dioxide, okay? Now, I'm going to do another video on the formal charges, but you guys should check this out also, formal charge. And you can check if this, this structure is right or not, okay? So that's one thing. But there is another structure that is also seen, you know, in between all this, in between all this rearrangement, there is also a possibility that this is just an intermediate structure. This piece right here, this is resonance. So one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, and one, two. And sometimes, you know, I see this, um, but you know, this is, I'm more convinced with the electronic configuration, what is happening in the electronic configuration, you, that, that is, you can deny that. That's not, that cannot be denied. There is this whole concept of hybridization, you know, where internal jumping happenings and, you know, those things. So we will discuss that later, but this is the, this is also, I've seen this in the books. So, you know, this thing, this structure can be, you know, if you can prove it by the formal charges, then, then so be it. But I'm going to do a next video, okay, on this. So now let's look at a scenario with sulfate. Sulfate, what's happening with sulfate? So, so we did H2S. This is, let's just do this. This is one example. Um, Yeah, this is one example with H2S. This is the second example with, um, with sulfur dioxide. And here is this like second example, second example with sulfur dioxide. And let's do the third example of sulfate. Okay, so here we have um, sulfur connected to four oxygens with minus two charge. So how do you do this? So here we have sulfur, one sulfur, four oxygens and two electrons involved. So sulfur is bringing six electrons, oxygen is bringing six electrons, and then you add these two electrons also. So here we have six and um, six, six fours are 24 and um, or 30 and then two more electrons. So this total becomes 32 electrons. So this is the total, total valence electrons are 32. Okay, next is sulfur will is has a lower electronegativity. Oxygen has a higher electronegativity. Sulfur can make two, four and six bonds and oxygen can make only two bonds. So, Fine, in this case, sulfur is making six bonds. So let's again, look at the electronic configuration of sulfur. And here we have 16 electrons. The inner core is, let's just do a different pen. Um, the sulfur, 16 electrons, neon, 10, and then three, S2, and 3p4. Um, okay, so back to the same thing. We have um, sulfurs 3s2, ground state, one, two, three, and then one, two, three, four, five. So this is 3s2 and 3p4, uh, and 3d is sitting vacant, and that is 3d0. This is the ground, ground state, electronic configuration. 
Okay, ground state electronic configuration. So what do we see here? 3S2 and 3P4, one, two, three, and four. And so once again, you know, we see that, yes, this is going to be, this is a normal state. But remember that anytime you excite an atom, which means you add more energy to it. So excited state, electronic configuration. Excited state electronic configuration, what does that look like? So here in this case, if there are uh, four oxygens with, like depends, you know, with four oxygens, what's the story? How does it look like? So here is the 3P and this is the 3D, one, two, three, four, five. So this is the 3D, this is the 3P and this is 3S, okay? So, excited so here in this case even so yes we would see that this cap has a capacity to come here and then this guy also has a capacity to jump and i don't know which one jumps where you know but uh, two are going to jump so two two electrons can jump two electrons two electrons can um can jump can jump okay so it is shown so in that case now what do we have one two three four five and six so there are six unpaired electrons six unpaired electrons and when there are six unpaired electrons that means they are looking to bond so that means six bonds possible six bonds sulfur can make six bonds right so pairing what is pairing pairing is bond formation pairing is equal to bond bonding so now comes oxygens now that means there are four oxygens are going to come right and these two are going to go with oxygen these two are going to go with one oxygen no wait one second um four yeah so wait oxygen is bringing okay so now we have four oxygens coming in and so what's happening here four oxygens have each is bringing two unpaired electrons okay two unpaired electrons on each oxygen and so sulfur can only make six electrons. So it will try to accommodate as much as is possible. So here we see, um, let's do this. So this electron and this one are going to overlap. This one and this one is overlapping. This one and this one is overlapping. So that's like, looks like a nice double bond. But the problem is these other guys. Oxygen is only left with two electrons. The oxygen, there are, there are like two electrons from each oxygen. There are four electrons that need to be, we have to take care of, but sulfur has only two electrons. So what's going to happen, it's going to form a bond with this one and it's left with one unpaired electron. One unpaired electron left. Okay, and similarly, this oxygen and this electrons get bonded, but this one also has one, ele one unpaired electron on each. So what do these electrons, what charge do the electrons have? Negative charge. So this is, this is these, so there are actually one electron, uh, let me put this here, one unpaired electron on, each oxygen, therefore two unpaired electrons total. And these two unpaired electrons, they are the ones that are responsible for the charge, the charge. They are the ones that make the charge, okay? So that charge of negative two on sulfate, SO4, 
minus 2 is coming from these guys. That is what it is. Okay. Now let's look at these bonds. These are the, like this is the, this looks, this is a double bond. Um, like this is a double. So these are two, two single bonds, two single bonds, and then one single bond each. So remember that anytime the two electrons are overlapping, they will form, um, you know, anytime two electrons are overlapping, there will always be a single bond and two single bonds make a double bond. Okay, now let's get started with the Lewis dot structure of sulfate. Lewis dot structure of of sulfate, SO4 minus two. Okay, so what is that? So here is this sulfur, um, like we are, we already talked about here, two valence. So here's the, this was it. So sulfur is going to be in the middle. Okay, so we have a total of 32 valence electrons and sulfur gets to be in the middle based on that. So, so number one was total of 32 valence electrons and sulfur in the middle, in, in center, and is a, is a central atom, okay? So based on its sulfur is the central atom. Okay, so now put sulfur in the middle and see what happens. All right, let's do this. Sulfur in the middle, oxygens on the side, and there are four oxygens, so it's okay to put them on different angles, right? And you connect them with a single bond. Two, three, four. How many did you use? We use one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 32 electrons minus eight. So you are left with four, 24 electrons. So the remaining 24 electrons go on this outside to fill the octet. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, and 24. All 24 have been used up in making the octet. Fine, you know, now you're going to do the checking. So check, check for well, number one, the need to make the bonds. Is that satisfied or not? Need to make the bonds, is that satisfied or not? Need to make the bonds. Sulfur wants to make, sulfur is in this case, can make four bonds and can make six bonds also, okay? Sulfur will make two bonds, yes, but it can, it's in this case, it will, it has expanded its capability. So it's making four bonds, which is a good thing, but it has a capacity to make six, six bonds. So it can accommodate more. And what about oxygen? Oxygen will make two bonds, two bonds for oxygen. But so clearly oxygen is not happy. Oxygen is not happy at all. Oxygens are unhappy. And, you know, sulfur is kind of making more bonds, you know, happy, but it can even expand more. So what is going to happen now? Rearrangement. And how? Rearrangement. And how is that? So we will have the sulfur coming in the middle. Okay. Let's put these oxygens on the side. And here you have single bonded. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. So in this rearrangement, one of the oxygens gives its lone pairs to sulfur, okay? And the other oxygen also gives its lone pairs to sulfur. So what's happening here? In this case, we see that and so this is all back and forth, you know. So here we will see sulfur now gets, and like just put these oxygens here. Okay, sulfur now, remember, sulfur can make six bonds. So sulfur is now making bonds like this and here. So sulfur, because of that, and this again, this is rearrangement even with the lone pair, spatial arrangement in 3D. 
okay, as far away. So the first one is more squished. The second one is more spread out. So these guys are the ones that are like placed at 90 degrees are more like constrained, but the upper ones are not. So anyways, so sulfur is making, in this case, sulfur is making, sulfur is making, six bonds. Now that's the maximum sulfur can do. Although each of the electron, uh, each of the oxygens are capable of doing the same thing as the other two oxygens have done, giving their lone pairs to make the double bond, you know? So these, these oxygens are happy. This one is also happy, but the other twos are not. They are not making the double bond. So this one is happy. This one is also happy, but these two, are not happy. So how do you show their unhappiness? By bringing in the negative charges. So that unhappiness is represented. So they have to bear the charge. So the upper two oxygens are making two bonds. So oxygens, at least two oxygens making two bonds. Okay, so now, in order to keep the other guys happy, there has to be the rotation of charges and the double bond. Rotation of charges and double bonds. And that means that everyone has to take turns. So now let's look at the second scenario. Second scenario is, okay, now comes the second scenario in which this double bond, this this guy, this guy comes here, and this guy moves up back. So now we have um, sulfur in the middle. This guy is still double bonded. Now I'm going to just put it like that. This is single bonded. This is double bonded, and this one is single bonded. Okay. So this guy. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so these guys will hold the negative charge, the ones with the single bond, but the double ones, are, but remember the charge is rotating. Now what's going to happen? This one can come and this one moves. Okay, so now what do we have? We have a structure which looks like this. So sulfur in the middle, and this one has a single bond, and this one will bear a charge. This one gave its lone pair. So this one is keeping a double bond, and this one is also double bonded, but this one is single bonded now. One, two, three, four, five, six. So now we have the charge negative and negative here. Okay, so we see that. Um, the charge is rotating and the double bonds are rotating. So now let's look at this scenario in which, again, you know, they keep on moving the charges. So this charge can come here and this one can go here. So we will have um, another scenario where we have sulfur in the middle and single bond single bond and one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, double bond and double bond. So everyone needs to get a turn now. Everyone gets a turn, okay? To keep the charge and the double bond one at a time. And this is happening very fast. So let's see if I got all these structures. Okay, so now this, this um, moves here and this, comes here. So this looks back to this one. So you see that the electrons, um, the total number of electrons remain the same, but the charges and the double bonds, they rotate. And this whole process is called resonance. Resonance, R-E-S-O-N-A-N-C-E. And these all of these structures are called the resonating structures, R E S O N A T I N G resonating structures. Okay, resonating structures. So these are all called the resonating structures. Okay, so this is this structure again. 
can be verified by formal charges on each of the atoms. Formal charges, and we're going to do a separate video on that, but formal charges on each atom. That can be verified, okay? The structure. Okay, so that was how the whole lecture on how sulfur would make two, four, and six bond. So based on that, I want you guys to look at on yourself independently conditions in which the uh, like the the uh, the phosphorus, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and even xenon can make you know uh, different types of atoms. Okay, and I tried to cover as much as I could, and I'm just hoping that that was easy. And if you have any questions, you can always ask me. All right. So thank you for watching. Bye-bye.